Welcome, everyone. Uh, very excited to be here talking with you guys today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Hearst Business Media and how we've been using tools like Chef to bring the community together. Uh, we're going to talk from a strategic level and then a tactical level. A little background on Hearst Business Media, or HBM. Uh, we have about 10 business units that operate more or less autonomously from one another. And we were looking at tools like Chef to help bring those teams together. Uh, you know, the, one of the interesting things for me is that uh, I don't normally think of tools as a unifying subject. Uh, tools oftentimes uh, don't bring teams together. In fact, they can be quite divisive. Um, you know, you can think of some examples like VI versus Emacs, right? Uh, and obviously one of these is far superior to the other. Um, you know which one. Uh, Linux versus Windows is another fantastic example. Maybe GIF versus GIF. Uh, maybe SharePoint versus the other 99% of the world. Or even some Comic Sans, right, versus, oh, come on, man, really? You got to put some Comic Sans. So I have to stand behind the podium, which is a little hard for me, but uh, so I'll wander. So I started thinking, okay, how can we look at tools uh, as a way to bring people together? We really wanted to focus heavily on a, a DevOps approach within, within uh, HBM. So I started thinking about, in order to drive uh, DevOps, we needed to have solid collaboration. And really solid collaboration requires good communication. And you can't communicate without a common language. And so I started thinking of the Tower of Babel and how we had this issue where developers would speak one language, ops would speak a different language, and how could we use that uh, we use Chef as a bridge to bring these two together. Uh, now, Hearst is a very large organization, and we could have taken a sort of very standard corporate approach to this, right? Uh, one where you would enact the PMO, you'd have a two-hour project kickoff meeting, and uh, no bathroom breaks, and by God, by the end, we would have a decision made, usually to have another meeting. So what we did instead was, so we're going to take a very informal approach to this, and we're going to focus on the behaviors that we want uh, and that is the DevOps approach, right? And that's, we're gonna collaborate. And so we just created a Slack room and invited everyone to the table. And the idea was that we would have uh, just an open forum communication. So if you're familiar with asynchronous versus synchronous uh, coding, uh, we didn't want any blocking, right? We didn't wanna only have things working when we were in a meeting. We wanted to be able to do this ad hoc and very informally. And this worked really, really well for us, right? We were focusing very heavily, notice, on the culture first, even before making the tool choice. And this was wonderful. And so I really started thinking, you know, tools don't make a culture, right? They're a byproduct of the culture. And so if we, if we continue along that line of thinking and apply Conway's law, not only to designing and deploying architects and systems, but also to choosing tools, it still really fits, right? We tend to select a tool that works for our communication patterns and our workflows. We also focused on Metcalfe's law, and that is the more voices we had in the communication, the better the output was going to become. We were more likely to come to a, an aligned decision than if I just made the decision and was prescriptive in how we rolled it out. So this was working very well for us, and we felt like we had a lot of momentum, a lot of velocity built up behind this. Chef was becoming the clear choice for us. It fit very well with our communication patterns. It fit very well with the sort of DevOps informal approach to how we were going to do things. Uh, and I started thinking about, you know, tools are a lot like cars. For some people, a car is a personification of their personality. It's an extension of who they are, right? They tend to self-identify with it. For a lot of us, we tend to do that with our tools. And so I started thinking, okay, we wanted to make sure everyone was at the table and not just a couple of key developers and a couple of key ops folks, right? We wanted everyone there. So we made sure folks like support, right? So support was invited to the table and they had a very solid voice. They were very important to this. Developers and operations, of course, were included. And so they were probably the key stakeholders, but they weren't the loudest voice in the room. Sometimes we invited managers, right? And if we could tear them away from leisure pursuits, uh, they were there in the meetings and they came in in a very ad hoc fashion and added a lot of value. Heck, even salespeople were invited to the table. And so it was wonderful for us to have this sort of ad hoc conversation around, is Chef the right tool for us? The reason that we ended up with Chef was because we had a lot of common problems across these different verticals inside of the businesses. 
everyone is facing a similar problem in that they need ephemeral environments, they need to be push button, they need to be fast, they need to be consistent. And so this was just one tool that really fit. There are multiple tools that you can do this, all the way down to just writing your own. But this one fit our culture. Now I know what you're thinking, right? You've got hundreds of people in one Slack room trying to decide anything sounds like absolute bedlam. And yeah, kind of was, right? But that was the point, was we needed a chaotic environment. We needed an environment where everyone could feel free to have a voice and speak up. Now, I'm not gonna sit here <laughs> and say that everyone agreed on Chef, right? At the end, it wasn't like a unanimous vote. So, so to kind of paraphrase Tyrion Lannister, right, you know, Chef had support of the people. Well, not all of the people, right? No tool that's ever existed had support of all of the people. And so what we did instead of focusing on everyone agreeing that Chef was the right tool, we all agreed to support the decision, whatever it may be, and to support each other. And that ended up being a much bigger value gain for us, rather than just saying Chef is the tool we chose. Chef happened to be the tool, right, because it was well aligned with our objectives and what we were, how we operated. Now that was wonderful and it was a great win for us strategically and culturally. But then how do you tactically deploy Chef to 10 different business units that run autonomously? It's a huge challenge. So what we did was we, we created a internal consultancy where we have dedicated engagements with the business units. And the idea there is that we are sort of like a force multiplier. Essentially we go in and help reduce the resource constraint issue. Everyone is super busy, everyone has a lot going on, right? You're trying to just keep up with with the product folks pushing features down the pipeline. So, you know, I, I got a lot of feedback of people saying, you know, Paul, it's a great idea. Totally believe in it. I, I don't know when I can actually do this. I, I just don't have the, the people, I don't have the resource, I don't have the money. So we put this team together, in essence, to try and help them overcome that, that barrier to, to entry. And so Aaron is here today to talk a little bit about uh, that one of those tactical engagements with uh, one of the business units. Uh, turn it over to Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Paulie. Oh, oh. Let's talk feedback. about feedback, right? Um, thank you very much, Pauly. Um, my name is Aaron Blythe. Um, so things you don't care to know about me. I grew up in the Quad Cities, which is a collection of cities uh, on the Illinois and Iowa border. And we drew kind of the sleepy portion of the afternoon, but luckily I don't think we drew the hungry portion of the afternoon. So I'll try to make this uh, interesting for you. Um, other facts you didn't know about me, I love pizza. Where I grew up in the Quad Cities, uh, there's Quad City style pizza. It's cut in these long strips, and when you go to pick it up, it just absolutely falls apart. And, and the grease. It is the greasiest sausage and pepperoni possible, so you think that the box is gonna fall apart before you get it home. It's freaking awesome, and I love it. So about Chef, um, the first day that I went to one of our business units and I started talking about Chef, one particular group that I was working with, I overheard all of these things on that very first day. Um, so we use Chef to create those machines, right? Um, if it takes over five minutes, we don't want it. Uh, when do you think we'll have the golden images uh, ready to hand over to Dev? And can we lift and shift our decades worth of software over in the next six months, uh, or in the next two months? Um, these are all valid questions. Um, they're slightly intimidating uh, and slightly off base with my view of the world uh, currently. So Wikipedia lists 13 styles of pizza in North America, one of which, of course, is from where I grew up, Quad City style pizza. So I need a volunteer. Does anybody want to volunteer? Right here. Um, so do you like pizza? Yes. What kind of pizza do you like? New York pizza from New York City. Um, what do you like about it? It's everything that everybody said it is. Yeah. Flavor, texture, what's a, size. What's the crust like? The crust is not too hard, not too thick, just right. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of cheese does it? Is it mozzarella or is it cheddar? Is it a blend? When was the last time you had this? Uh, two years ago when I was younger. And do you have good memories that are tied to that? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Um, most people actually listen with the intent to uh, 
do not listen with the intent to understand. They actually listen with the intent to reply. This comes from Stephen Covey, a uh, very popular book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So what we've learned in these engagements is that we ask follow-up questions. Personally, I'm working on trying not to offer solutions until I've asked at least a couple of questions to follow up on any answer that I get. It's an interesting phenomenon that we have as technical people that we'll start answering questions that were never asked because we know the answers to those questions. So we just start answering things and talking over people, right? As a technical person myself, I have to temper that in myself. Um, so by asking questions about pizza just a minute ago, I was able to reveal more of the why instead of just that initial answer of the New York style pizza and some of the reasons behind it and some of the, so a little bit more of the what. So people dig in when they're confronted with evidence that's contrary to their belief. Um, if you're trying to influence uh, change or teach something, the most effective thing to do is listen as opposed to simply like pushing the ideas that, um, or the information that you have. This is quite an, uh, counterintuitive to my logical brain. I've learned the hard way um, a number of times uh, in my career. So I present this awesome logical argument, right? It's super. It's absolutely bulletproof. Everybody will agree with me that it is the exact right thing to do, right? And then when we go to do it, like it doesn't work, and I don't understand why. So let's try something visceral. Think in your head about that most recent um, Facebook argument that you saw or that you participated in, where you were absolutely right. Did you actually change anyone's mind? Uh, or did the person actually change anyone's mind, even though they came with all these facts that backed up everything that they were um, thinking? So this is the first lesson that I have for you guys, is to listen. Here's a list of the questions that Paul and I have come up with uh, over the past six months. Um, these questions can save us a lot of time. Uh, when we start, we only ask uh, more questions based on the answers to these, and then only offer solutions if we're directly asked for them. You'd be surprised at how long you can go uh, before you're actually asked for your opinion, right? So the questions are, are very visceral at, to begin, like, what keeps you up at night? What are you worried about? Can you draw for me how you think your system uh, currently works? Or can you tell me about the software solutions that, that you deliver? Like, what are, what are you delivering to your customer? How does X fit with Y? Can you draw that for me? And tell me about your favorite process. How would you rip that apart and make that better? And then sit back and listen and just ask more questions. Um, so here's possible uh, ingredients that we could have for a pizza if we were to make a pizza here together. So is anybody in the room gluten intolerant? Okay, so we've got one, so we can't use dough. Um, is anybody allergic to dairy? We've got one of those, so we, we can't really use cheese. Is anybody a vegetarian? Okay, we have a vegetarian. So um, basically what we have left is uh, vegetables and tomato sauce. Um, the point is that we're not going to agree on everything if we've got a large collection of people, right? So we have to start somewhere, even if that's um, just, you know, veggie tomato soup. Um, this agreement that you have should not be overbearing. So when we started with our um, business unit, um, we didn't start by trying to agree that we we're going to use Burke Shelf or which particular cookbooks we were going to use. Our agreement was that we we're going to use AWS and Git. We're going to try to use CloudFormation and Chef. We're going to try those things out, do proof of concepts, and see if it feels right. Um, we need to find a way to manage secrets. We knew that we had to find that, but we didn't know what the exact implementation was going to be. And the configuration will be jointly done by both dev and ops. So the second thing uh, I have for you is agreement. You have to find that agreement. And the agreement's not going to be about every single thing, but it's going to be from listening and actually finding things that are common. So let me Tarantino this for a minute and back up to before we started this engagement um, with our business unit, Fitch. There was a lot of groundwork that we laid in the space of education. Um, you have to make sure that somebody on the inside knows what's going on. That they need to know the story backwards and forwards, like including what kind of soap is in the bathroom. So we set up education. We led one hour discussion to get our users connected into our Chef server and get Chef DK uh, installed. We did about eight of these sessions, the one-hour sessions, um, because we knew that scheduling-wise, we wanted to get a large number of people to at least have Chef installed so they could start um, using this. And we did this across all of our business units. Then we brought in um, Chef, um, like educators at Chef, to do a two-day course on Chef Fundamentals so we could get those um, SMEs or um, subject matter experts that really know what they're doing at each of our business units. 
And then we had focus sessions with this particular business unit where we, um, we took the Apache cookbook and we did things with it. And then at the end of the two hour sessions, we threw that code away. It was a nice safe environment where we're creating something, we're learning something, but we don't have all of that weight of, oh gosh, I have to maintain this and that scares me and I don't wanna make any mistakes. Another thing that we did in the background is we set up uh, Enterprise Chef in AWS. So this is our current architecture for the Enterprise Chef server. We do not manage a back-end Chef server. Let me repeat that. Our Enterprise Chef setup does not have a back-end Chef server. Applause. Um, we're using Amazon RDS and, uh, with Postgres, and we're using Amazon Electric uh, Elastic Search Service, and then we just have the front end so that we can, um, we can use that resiliency that's built into AWS, and then we auto-scale those front ends, and we have um, Urshef running uh, up there on the front. So this gives us like, all kinds of um, resiliency, and the other piece that it gets us is I think we're spending about $100 less um, on, per month on Amazon services to run this. So this is completely open source. You have Levi Smith um, to uh, thank for this. He really likes beer, so if you can find him at the conference, you should buy him a beer and uh, ask him about it. But you can take a look at our CloudFormation template and our cookbooks that help us set Enterprise Chef up this way. Um, since we provide software as a service on our team, the first thing we're asked for is an SLA, um, which we already had um, to go over with one of our uh, business units. Uh, Fitch was trying to say that, well, we should run the Chef server ourselves. And we're like, well, that's really the benefit that we have. If we put a lot of research into this and we have it set up for you, and look over the resiliency and the numbers that we can show you, plus we'll keep it uh, maintained and up to date and, and give you those things. We were able to convince them through the way that we um, both were prepared and already had the software ready for them that they should go um, with us as a centralized service. So now for some education on pizza. Uh, Americans eat uh, about 350 slices of pizza per second. It's about 100 acres of pizza per day. Which brings us to our third lesson, which really happened first in the timeline of the world um, that you should educate and enable. Um, for the low price of roughly about three uh, days per person, uh, we at least have this base under understanding of chef uh, that we can start to build on as we do our engagements. So after listening, listening, educating, and agreeing, we jumped right in. And this diagram here is purposely rudimentary. It's the culmination of three diagrams we had drawn many times on the board in those first couple days. So if I walk you through this diagram, let's look just at the top part. Um, eventually, we want to build up to using CloudFormation um, to set up these two things, the chef node and the run list. However, we need to work up to that. So first, we're going to use um, Test Kitchen with Vagrant on the local machines of our developers. Then we're going to move on and use Test Kitchen and EC2. Then our next step will be to use Knife EC2, which will build us up to using CloudFormation to bootstrap that chef server and get the node and the run list set. Then we move to the bottom half of the diagram, um, which we plan to use wrapper uh, cookbook pattern, which is really popular, but we'll get more to that in a second. Which brings us to our next lesson, which is start, even if it's wrong. So here's the rules that we um, agreed to live by, is that we want to, um, in all cases, write as little code as possible. We want to re rely on existing chef paradigms, um, so the chef resources that are built directly into chef, and then rely on community cookbooks when those are available. And then use that application uh, wrapper cookbook and um, to focus on the specific applications that are owned by, each, uh, by this particular business unit, because there's sections, uh, teams within the business unit. We want to write com concise recipes with only a few calls to resources. So if we're going to write concise recipes with only a few calls to resources, then we're going to have to have resources that do a lot of the work. So we're going to write custom resource cookbooks. Again, we want to rely on the community cookbooks when that's appropriate. Um, we're going to use those key indicators that we see inside of supermarket. Is it post 1.0? Does it have a lot of followers? Um, are there key community members that are part of it? Are they actually closing their issues in GitHub? Um, and then if, if we can't find a community cookbook, we might find one that's close, so we'll fork that, we'll rename it, which is a really important thing to do if you're using Berkshelf so you don't get name collisions, and, um, and then we'll start working from there. So now we've taken on some ownership. And then in the last case, we'll actually create custom resources as a last result. 
Um, we also, so during this process, um, we, we read a lot of the README files. And I feel like this is um, a key way to, um, to know how to utilize things. Uh, Chef, more than any other community I've been uh, in, README-driven development is awesome. So like, you start to write out what you're actually doing before you actually do it. So many years ago, I worked with an architect who was my manager who challenged me, you need to learn how to write code without writing code, right? So the first week during the day, um, it was totally hands off the keyboard for me. This was absolutely excruciating, right? We would put the code up on a wall and we would talk through it. I would build code at night and then throw it away and not look at it, only to try to recreate it through someone else's fingers on the keyboard the next day. So for anyone looking to grow as a developer, I suggest finding a way to put yourself through this experience. Um, some people call it pairing, some people call it mentoring. Uh, I just call it communicating and learning, uh, making sure that you're also teaching while you're um, in the process of learning. Because the questions that you get asked from the people that you're teaching along the way are questions that you're never gonna come up with on your own. So you end up learning more deeply than, um, than you would just by yourself. So that brings us to our next lesson, which is to make up rules to live by. Um, so again, we plan to use wrapper cookbooks. Our diagram ended up looking more like this after we had spent some more time on it, which is a little bit prettier, um, but it's the same basic idea, is that um, we're gonna have these really short recipes, and those short recipes are gonna call out to um, resources that are gonna do the bulk of our work. Some of those resources that you can see here, like the Apache cookbook or Java cookbook, are um, ones that uh, are community-owned, but then we had to write our own for Wildfly and Spring Boot. So if you look, uh, look at the code here, this is our base recipe, we wanted reusability here, and this is what I'm talking about, very simple recipe, right? You ensure that we have a group, a user, and the application root set up. Um, this will help us in two different ways. Uh, future decomposition, um, meaning that we can shoot for running one of the apps on a single um, Chef client, because initially we're trying to do lift and shift and they're running everything in VMware all on the same node. So we're gonna move it into AWS that way, maybe, until we get smarter, and then we actually start breaking these off into separate AMIs. It's also dry, so we don't repeat ourselves. The application recipe ends up having one resource call, but first we do all of our error checking to make sure our environmentals are set. Because it's, um, so we made sure all of our attributes are set to nil or empty string, then we, we, um, we swing through those and make sure that they actually have something set, otherwise we um, error out really early and then we just go straight to the resource. Um, the resource is huge, right? Um, it's where all the logic for installing and configuring our application lives. As you can see, this is a lot of code. Mostly it relies on primitives in Chef, like directory, template, service, et cetera. But it's where the logic is, too. So one thing we ran into is that it's really hard to um, consume and test a custom resource when you're using another cookbook. Um, you must check in that code um, and delete uh, the berkshelf.lock and then pull that down or else bump a version, and it gets rather cum cumbersome. So what we did was we switched over and called a, um, a recipe that lives in that custom resource cookbook that lives in the test fixtures um, folder. So that way we've got a cookbook inside of our cookbook that ex exercises our custom resource. So then we can get that development cycle to be really, really fast on our custom resource without having to check out um, all the time on the, um, the wrapper cookbook that's using this custom resource. This gives an incredible lift and we were able to write resources in a couple days as opposed to you know, fighting with things back and forth and making bad decisions of not putting code in because the cycle is too long. Um, so now that we've worked down underneath, we're gonna go back up and we're gonna try to build up um, this thing here, where we start with um, Test Kitchen and Vagrant. And then we, um, we take basically the stock Vagrant setup, calling our test recipe, right? And then we move that into Kitchen EC2. As you can see, this gets a little bit more complicated, but one uh, principle that we had here is we wanted to make sure that we don't check in any credentials, because we don't want any of that to be in there, so we set environment variables. And so we have a separate, we have a kitchen.yaml and a kitchenec2.yaml. We set the environment variables that have our credentials on our, um, our local machines. And now we're spinning up EC2 instances, um, just like we would um, from our kitchen uh, vagrant. Then we move to CloudFormation. We exploited the fact that you can use that user data field to deliver bash commands in CloudFormation. Um, 
However, like if you're familiar with this at all, like it's terrible. There's bash inside of JSON. There's like strings that uh, are executing all of this bash commands. Basically, this had Levi on our team um, pretty much every day, uh, posting things like this inside of our Slack channel about how frustrated he was with strings uh, that were bash inside of JSON. So we cleaned this up considerably um, into four sections. So inside of that bash, we update the OS to get a nice uh, base um, there. We use Ubuntu, our um, business units use uh, RHEL. We acquire the script that's checked in right next to this, and then we set the environment variables for the script to use. Then we run the script, and the script does all of that work. Um, the, um, this is much more ele elegant, but this is still kind of no punk to work with. So we have this also open source and checked in uh, into GitHub. So this script um, that, that sits next to the JSON is now testable as long as we set those environment variables on an EC2 instance. So we can just spin up an EC2 instance and we can run that script and it's going to um, bootstrap into the Chef server, set the run list, um, and get us actually up and going and have our cookbooks um, there and available. So I've shown you enough code. Uh, almost all the code that we write uh, in this space is open source. You can, it can be found on github.com slash Hearst uh, AT for automation team. So this is what we ended up with, um, and we were able to actually spin up um, the application, um, which was pretty cool. Um, the Quad Cities also lays claim to being the origin of taco pizza. So we're like, we're an awesome pizza town, right? Um, which is something that I've actually loved uh, since I was growing up, and still to this day, I love taco pizza. Um, Happy Joe's created taco pizza by mixing two things uh, that were never intended on being together, tacos and pizza, right? Um, so sometimes you need to actually fork something um, that's super awesome and then make it better. Um, so that brings me to uh, my next lesson is be agile and break those rules that you just created. Um, so in some cases, the community cookbooks that we started with, they didn't suffice. So we started um, forking more and more of those because we were more and more comfortable um, with Chef. And this got us up and running really quickly to get something running, but then it also helped us move quickly um, throughout time. For the second week that I was up there doing the, um, the engagement with um, Fitch, we didn't have a room. So we were in this library, right? Fitch has been around for um, like 100 years, right? And they used to publish these volumes that you can kind of see off on the side of ratings uh, in a yearly type of um, book that would, that would go out, right? Um, and they've moved um, awesome with technology as technology has moved through the years. Um, I remember seeing a lot of books like Cold Fusion laying around, and now they um, are banging all these awesome um, Java apps and stuff. So th they were um, in no way scared of actually making um, this move um, to DevOps. So the new rule that we created um, was around run lists and um, environments. So this is my fourth ChefConf that I've been to, and every year there's like role bashing. I haven't heard it that much this year. Um, I used to love roles. I think that um, some of the chef success engineers could tell you how I loved roles too much because we created this monster at my last job where we had like way too many roles or whatever. But I can see how they could be overused and stacked on top of each other and create a huge mess. So our rule was that we were going to use a base role for the, um, the infrastructure layer to help us set up all the things um, the way that we wanted for security and for our system admins. And then we, for the application cookbook, if there's any attributes that we needed to use, we would use environments. Um, and that way, um, we only need um, to come together at that environmental level. Um, so my next rule is to foster open communication. Um, an interesting thing about Fitch is that their dev is in Chicago and their operations um, runs in New York. So by asking these three questions, um, more answers have come from people working together than I have actually provided myself. Remember, I'm neither on these teams, uh, nor am I like the proverbial like, understander of all the things. Like a lot of times people ask me questions, and since I work remote, I'm looking that up on Google. That's what I'm doing behind the scenes. I'm not some oracle by any means. So the questions are fairly simple. Um, that's a great question. Can you ask that in uh, the specific Slack channel associated with that? Excellent. Um, where is that code checked in so we can all see it? And um, do you know if there's a Confluence doc for that yet? And then my final um, 
guide is pivot. Start answering questions with uh, questions. So for, uh, for this, I look to like my favorite guy, Socrates, right? Um, I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. Um, or Ted, like, all we are is dust in the wind, dude. Sorry for the younger folks. This movie was huge when I was a kid. Like, it was awesome. Um, so by the way, I'm the co-organizer of DevOps Kansas City. And our registration and call for papers is open. And we'd love to um, have you guys come out to Kansas City. If you happen to be in KC, uh, look me up. We have Minsky's Pizza. Uh, my favorite on the menu is their cheeseburger pizza. The menu says the sauce is sweet. But I'm pretty sure that it's ketchup and mustard. Right? And of course, there's hamburger, um, onions, pickles. Um, and pro tip, it doesn't say it on the menu. But if you ask, they will put bacon on it to make it a bacon cheeseburger pizza, which is like super awesome. Um, and for those of you that believe this presentation was um, a little too heavy on pizza, I want to remind you that your company or you paid a lot of money to come to a conference on Chef, which has all sorts of food memed uh, things. So uh, none of your non-technical friends are going to know what the heck you were talking about when you come home and say you went to a conference on Chef, so at least you learned a couple things about pizza. <laughs> and that's all I have. I'm interested in what you guys think. I have a handheld if anyone wants questions, I'll walk it around. All right. <laughs> so do you use roles at all anymore? Because it doesn't seem that they're, um, well, except for the base role, but besides that, are there roles anywhere else? Uh, for the most part, we've, so we, I took you through the evolution of where we went to. And now they're getting to where they're spinning up dev machines. We're coaching them to stay with environments. And then when they go to that UAT um, and, the, and other testing environments and into prod, we want to stay with environments across the board. OK. So are you advocating two layers of recipes? Or do you actually think that having recipes include recipes include recipes is it OK? Or is two layers, like, and then b below that, a resource-oriented approach? Is that the model? That's what we're advocating, is to keep it as simple as possible until we have um, that next layer. And I think that they're going to run into that soon. Um, and there, we might put another layer of cookbooks on top of it. Uh, if you've like seen some of the wrapper cookbook patterns that people have used, where they put all of the attributes and have no roles, they have an attributes, and then they have a switch. Like, here's dev, here's UAT. And then they have a, the list of uh, attributes there. So the only attribute you have to set is dev. And then you've got it all in one cookbook. Do you have an opinion about how many layers of inclusion of recipe is appropriate? Where, for example, our organization currently thinks that a resource-oriented approach is the way to go and to minimize the amount of inclusion of recipes in dev? Um, because you're using um, community cookbooks underneath, I think that'll end up going four or five deep. Um, but I think the ones that you write, I, I would stick with the two levels. Like you have that wrapper cookbook and then resources underneath that is my recommendation. And less, until you have complexity enough to go farther. Do you have another question? Uh, looking at this, uh, I think you've progressed quite a bit in terms of evolution of chef, right? So I just wanted to understand if you have figured out any other use cases uh, in terms of using chef, uh, and where else could be could it be used other than its core thing of config management? Uh, mm -hmm. And for example, are you using it for deployments? Are you using it for, say, patch management, et cetera? Um, for the, the core chef project, uh, a product um, like the, the Chef Client, that's actually something that I didn't put in the slides, but it's something that we talked about a lot with this business unit is um, you see all of these things that Chef is used for or whatever, um, and we kind of knew that there's, there's more products that you know they talked about um, this morning. Use the Chef Client for what it's intended for, which is configuration management, and try to, to box it into that. And then you use things like CloudFormation to do your orchestration and, and deployments, because you're going to have to pull in all of the, um, uh, the networking and, and all of that stuff. So we want to make sure that it, it is code and it's, it's checked in.
But again, we want to keep it simple. Um, I would add one thing to that. I've, I have seen an organization use it uh, almost as a CDN. Um, Chef's not that great at pushing large binaries, uh, especially if you're using hosted Chef. And so, again, I think to Aaron's point, right, think about the core competency of the product. <clears throat> we do use it for compliance. We do use it for some patch management, and it is something that we're looking at actually adopting more of, uh, trying to figure out how it fits our specific patterns. At Hearst Business Media, we have three verticals. We have, we have transportation, we have finance, which is Fitch, and, and then we have healthcare. And all three of those have very differing needs, right, especially around compliance uh, and regulatory issues. And so uh, trying to find a way for Chef to help with patch management. And we also are a heterogeneous environment. So uh, we're probably 80% Windows, 20% Nix-based systems. Um, that is kind of shifting maybe more towards the open source and Nix-based systems as we move along 2016 and into 2017. Uh, certainly new projects are predominantly in the cloud using things like Lambda and, and, and others. And so um, that produces yet another challenge of, okay, how can we gain consistency for patch management and compliance? Uh, and it's something that we're working very closely with Chef on, uh, specifically around the healthcare units that require HIPAA and PHI, right? When you're dealing with EMR and electronic uh, medical records, uh, that's a very sensitive uh, area and those compliance those compliance uh, tactics have to be very tight because once you go through an audit, they can be quite painful if, if you don't have everything buttoned up. Thank you. Uh, who's actually writing these cookbooks that are being used? Do you have like separate operational teams or is this being given directly to developers? And then I kind of have a follow-up question. The, the question was, um, who's actually writing these? Um, and that's one that, um, given my past experience and even this experience, it started with um, kind of a, a tools team, kind of a DevOps team. Uh, they, they've uh, kind of set up their Atlassian stack. And then actually, in another engagement with them, I've actually helped them uh, chefify their um, Atlassian stuff. Uh, so not given time constraints, we didn't really go into all the different things that we've done with them. But they started with it, and then they're, they've been teaching the dev teams and then I've actually worked with directly with the operational team, and we're starting to write that core base cookbook that'll have the um, the roles around it. So there's kind of three pockets. Um, there's like you know getting getting that core like uh, igniter team, and then the dev teams are are doing the ones specific for their wildfly and spring boot stuff because they know like the the settings that you need in there. So we kind of had to teach them, and then the operations team with their very specific stuff that they want to do with. Uh, with all the Linux and networking set up. And uh, you mentioned like specifically patch management. Uh, I imagine that if you have a dedicated operational team, they're usually the ones responsible for that sort of a thing getting rolled out, not the individual application owners. So uh, how do you deal with coordinating those sorts of like platform level, uh, we need to keep this compliant or we need to patch this with uh, application configuration and stuff like that? So, I mean, essentially, you know, each business unit, again, operates sort of autonomously, and so they have their own workflows. Uh, the objective for us embedding in the team as a consultant isn't necessarily to define that and be prescriptive. It's to be a mentor and sit alongside and help guide those decisions. Uh, each one kind of approaches it a little bit differently, which is actually a good thing because, again, that flexibility uh, needs to remain in the business unit. We have very little domain knowledge inside of the business. Uh, and so maintaining that consistency, typically we focus on workflows and process as opposed to tools at that point uh, and trying to make sure that everyone is in agreement and in alignment on how that's going to work. Uh, again, of course, one of the big issues in the SDLC is the fact that as you go through that value stream, the lack of consistency between environments becomes more and more apparent and more and more impactful. Uh, this is where things like you know, containers and chef and potentially habitat uh, can really help us. And so what we're trying to achieve here is if we don't collaborate in choosing the tool, this is why it was so important to, to get together to all agree that this was the tool we were going to use, uh, you're going to have all these differing workflows. And then you have these huge friction points at the handoffs. Um, and it, typically, the, you have a much higher degree of friction, uh, friction uh, anytime a human has to touch it. So we're like, let's automate as much of this as possible. And the only way you can do that is to maintain consistent 
uh, state and, no, and, and very little configuration drift throughout that process. So that meant it wasn't just dev and ops, right? We needed QA, we needed security, we needed all of the teams that were going to contribute and touch the code to be a part of the conversation and agree. And then when we started creating those workflows, we all did that together as a team. So that's looking at it strategically. The, um, tactically, I think what they're, they're going after the stack that for this particular business unit is they're using a mix of the, the cloud formation. Uh, like I said, they're, they're building AMIs um, using Packer. So that's going to try to help uh, get some of that base consideration as opposed to trying to uh, do patch management um, through Chef there. But I think they're gonna use Chef to, to do the Packer. AMI uh, thing, but the, it's an ongoing discussion. And as we, as we all learn more, uh, like myself included, um, it's been an interesting discussion, but it's not one that I think that as, we, as we're going from their data center up into AWS that they have fully answered yet. So it's one that I would love to have more of a conversation with anybody in this room on to, to learn new and better ways to do it. That's all we have time for, so thank you, Polly and Aaron. Thank you. Appreciate it.